Hi everyone, and welcome to our video for the 1690 course, Introduction to Biostatistics. Today's video will be covering material from Lecture 1, and will be defining basic concepts, as well as learning how we classify variables in biostatistics. Let's dive right in with defining what biostatistics means. In statistics, we collect, organize, and analyze information from a scenario so we can understand that scenario better. The bio part of biostatistics refers to the fact that we are studying the health of other humans. For example, we can start with a group of people, collect information about those people, turn the information into numbers, analyze those numbers, and then use the findings to better understand that group of people. Variables are characteristics that vary from one person to another in a population or group. When we study these variables, we have different ways of classifying them. These different classifications change the way that we analyze them as numbers. The three ways we categorize variables are by gappiness, levels of measurement, and descriptive orientation. Gappiness refers to how you count what it is that you're measuring. If you were counting the number of people that were waiting in a hospital waiting room, for example, you have to count them by whole numbers or integers. You cannot have one-third of a person sitting in a waiting room. We call these discrete variables. But if you were looking at cholesterol levels, for example, you could have a measurement that is counted as 136.24. We call these continuous variables because there we don't have to leave a gap between one measurement and the next. Another category of variables that we commonly use in biostatistics is the level of measurement, that is, whether the information being collected is qualitative or quantitative in nature. Sometimes when we collect information, all we can do is give a name to the variable. For example, when we measure sex, male or female, or marital status. These are called nominal because really all we're doing is naming them. Other times, we group variables together, for example, an age group. There are many ways that I could group people by age, and some of these groups have, many me have more meaning than others. No matter how I group them, they all follow an order from youngest to oldest, so we call this category of qualitative variables ordinal. One important point about ordinal variables is that I decide how the groups are divided up, so the distance between the groups doesn't automatically mean anything. Quantitative variables are measured in numbers where the distance between those numbers means something, and it can be measured. There are two different types of quantitative variables that are distinct because of how they define zero. Interval variables have a zero value, or starting point, that is made up. For example, to be admitted to graduate school, you have to score above a certain point on the GRE, but the lowest score possible is 130 points, which is an arbitrary zero that the test makers have determined. It's still a qualitative variable, though, because the distance between the numbers means something. A score of 160 is still measurably, measurably better than a score of 135. Ratio variables are much more common quantitative variables because when they refer to zero, they really mean zero. They have a true zero point where zero really means the absence of the thing you are measuring. Examples of ratio variables can be anything from the number of dollars in a bank account to height in inches to blood sugar levels. There's one last way that we can classify variables by descriptive orientation. We can then categorize variables by how they relate to one another. A researcher doing a study on a group of people will decide what variable is most important to her study. The variable that is used to describe other variables is called the independent variable. It is the starting point from which you describe every other variable. For example, if you are interested in studying smoking and the effect smoking has on the health of the smoker, then smoking would be your independent variable. Your study would investigate what illnesses people have that are related to smoking. Your dependent variables in that example would be all the illnesses that you find when you study your smokers. You might find lung cancer, chronic bronchitis, stroke, heart disease, etc. All these things that you would find would be your dependent variables because they all come from studying smoking, your independent variable. Finally, you'd have to consider all the things that impact your study and change the relationship of your variables. In this example, you need to consider what variables change the way that smoking interacts with the health of the smokers. 
Genetics, air pollution, age, gender, all of these influence the health of a smoker. For example, men smoke more than women, and they are more likely than women to get lung cancer. These types of variables, the ones that influence the relationship between the independent and the dependent variables, and they generally make things more complex, are called confounding variables. They're also known as covariables or control variables. So those are the ways that we categorize the different variables uh, that we study in public health. There are pros and cons to each method of classifying variables, and as you learn more about biostatistics, you'll be able to choose what will work for you and the way you want to study health outcomes. Thank you for watching, and be on the lookout for our next video when we'll be discussing descriptive statistics as well as going over some of the symbols and notations that are commonly used in biostatistics.